everybody in this room has testimonies on testimonies of how God has brought us out of things that we didn't think we could get through. He has been good and He has been faithful time in and time out. So I don't know what you're going through tonight, but I know that we serve a God that is so good that He will bring you out of it and He will be good as we declare that tonight. Let's declare that together, that He is too good to not believe that He will do it.
tonight. How many know that if it's said in His Word, He will perform it? Amen. How many know that there is nothing that we can do to make Him any more powerful than He already is here tonight? All we can do is come to this place with a bit of faith. How many have faith here tonight that He can move the immovable? He can change the unchangeable. He can perform miracles in your life here tonight. If you believe that, would you lift your hands to heaven? Would you open up your mouth and give God glory that He is more than able? He can do it here tonight. If if you believe that, come on, would you open up your mouth? Would you lift up your hands? We serve a God that is all powerful. And if we mix a little bit of faith with with His Word, He can perform it here tonight. We love you, Jesus. Come on, come on, let's open up our mouth. Let's lift our hands right now. Let's introduce some faith into this place here because God can do the miraculous here today. He can remove cancer. We sang it here before. He can change the unchangeable. He can turn around any situation. If you believe that right now, would you lift up your voice? to have the power he holds all power we need to believe him at his word amen can anybody testify tonight that you've come to this house with a need and he's come through for you before I want to tell you that if you've come here tonight with a need he can come through for you again would you put your hands together for Jesus right now if you believe that he can move in your life here tonight hallelujah Praise God. Let's give our musicians a round of applause. Thank you, musicians. Thank you for leading us into worship. Praise God. Amen. We're excited for what God's going to do here tonight. And it brings me great delight. I'm going to get out of your way and invite our speaker. But our speaker has been to Australia before. He's no stranger to this country. Came here for a Turning Point conference a number of years ago, and he tremendously blessed us. But since then, we have been blessed to remain connected. Our speaker serves locally as the executive pastor of LifePoint Church in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. He was the national youth president of Canada for many years. And he is the host of the second best apostolic podcast, Restorationist. Uh, It's wonderful. But we are blessed to have this great man of God here with us. He's going to bless you here tonight. Do you have a little faith here? Amen. Will you preach with him? Are you willing to respond to the word of God? Reverend Adam Shaw, would you please come? Let's put our hands together for Brother Shaw. Lift your hands in Jesus. Come on, the presence of the Lord is here. We're just going to entertain him for a few moments. Come on, you team, help me out. Let's sing the bridge. You said, I believe. Come on, why don't you lift your hands? We're in no rush here tonight. I just want to park in this moment. Come on, 
want to hear you singing. I believe, yes, Lord. It is done one more time. You said, I believe. You said, it is done. Now, why don't you just give God praise right now, Lord of this room. Hallelujah. Oh, we love you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 35. We're going to read verses 1 through 4 and then 9 through 15. Number of scriptures, but I want to capture the essence of this story as we unpack it here together. I just want to say while you're opening your Bible apps, turning into your analog Bibles if you're old school like me, it is an honor to be back in Australia, back in Sydney, and specifically back at the Pentecostals of Sydney. It is such an honor. Thank you for letting me come. Thank you to Pastor Harvey and this incredible ministry team for uh, giving me the honor. It's so great to be with my friends, Greg, who I know as American Greg and Australian Greg. And uh, and it is such an honor. Thank you. We had such a great time hanging out today. Uh, Pastor Greg, you're doing a wonderful job with this youth team, the youth ministry. And um, thank you for inviting me to, to be a part of this, this conference. I'm glad we have been able to stay connected. And... Uh, Genesis chapter 35. While I was talking, you were finding it in your Bible. And then I was talking and I didn't find it in mine yet. So just if you just want to just hold up for like a couple seconds. Here we, <laughs> here we go. Then God said to Jacob, Arise and go up to Bethel and dwell there and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. And Jacob said to his household and all who were with him, put away the foreign gods that are among you, purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel and I will make an altar there to God who answered me in the day of my distress and has has been with me in the way which I have gone. So they gave Jacob all their foreign gods, which were in their hands and the earrings, which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree, which was by Shechem. Jump down to verse 9 with me. Then God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Padan Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, Your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. Also God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and company of nations shall proceed from you and kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, I give to you and to your descendants. After you, I give this land. Then God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. So Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, a pillar of stone and poured a drink offering on it, and he poured oil on it. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spoke with him, Bethel. With the help of the Holy Spirit here today, I want to preach to you on this subject, after the terebinth tree. I believe that I have felt in the Holy Ghost that this is going to be a powerful weekend, not because I am here. I just happen to be the person that God asked, God opened the door for me to be here, but it is going to be a powerful weekend because Jesus is here. There's going to be impartation, there's going to be revelation, there's going to come supernatural healing. I believe on Sunday we're going to see God perform miracles in minds. We're going to see God impart to a generation anointing and power and gifts tomorrow night. It's going to happen. He's going to fill us with tenacity. But there's a step to that, that we've got to make first. And that's what I want to preach to you here tonight. Tonight could arguably be the most important thing, the most important message that you hear, message that I deliver, because it's going to be the step that's going to take us where God wants us to go this weekend. Let's lift our hands and let's pray. Jesus, we love you. Lord, I have sensed great anticipation 
God, I have sensed your spirit wanting to move, God, leading up to this event until now. Lord, I have sensed in the spirit that Jesus, you're wanting to do deep and mighty and great things. Not just in a generation of young people, but in everyone that is here. But God, there is a process that we cannot short circuit on the way to our purpose and on the way, God, to experiencing deliverance. That, Lord, we must pass by tonight. You're here right now, Jesus. Be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. God bless you and you may be seated. Jacob's life is an absolute mess. Jacob's life, it, it, I mean, it was a mess before chapter 35. But right now it is a really big mess. Let, let me give you just a, a quick snapshot, a quick summary of what's been happening in the life of Jacob up until now. First, he's married to a woman who he doesn't love and also to one he does. And they're both sisters. So he's got that going on. He's been in conflict with the father of both of his wives, father-in-law Laban, who has tricked him multiple times, first of which getting him so absolutely wasted drunk that he didn't recognize he was marrying the wrong woman until it was too late. Then, he's had a run-in with his brother Esau, whom he had deceived decades earlier. It went well in the end, but his fear and anticipation and dread was so great that he literally split his family into two camps so that if Esau attacked, he'd only kill half the family and half the family business. And then it seems to be going okay. And they settle in Shechem after this run-in with Esau, only to have his daughter, Dina, sexually assaulted by the prince of that city-state. And to make matters worse, two of his sons, Simeon and Levi, acting in retaliation, after convincing the men of Shechem to be circumcised by saying, we'll have better business deals, if you will, they sneak in with their servants and murder every man in Shechem. They plunder their wealth in a stunning act of vigilante justice. Plunder their wealth, steal all of their chickens, their hens, their sheep, and their goats, and kidnap the women and children. This is Jacob's life thus far. He's got two wives, one he doesn't like, one he does. Bad relationship with his father-in-law. Worried his relationship with his brother so bad he literally thought his brother was going to actually kill him. Not when you say you're going to kill your brother, you don't actually mean it. He actually thought his brother was going to kill him. His sons have committed mass murder in a city. His daughter has been assaulted and here he is, just Genesis 34. We get to Genesis 35 and God says to Jacob, you probably need to leave. You probably, after your sons have burned everything to the ground, stole all the chickens, killed all the men, this is no longer probably a neighborhood in which you are welcome. So you need to go. And here's what I want you to do, he said. I want you to go back to the first place that we really met and talked. Remember when you ran away from your family the first time? I need you to go back to Bethel. A lot has transpired in your life. Jacob, it's time to get your life back on track. And you need to go back to the place where you really saw me for the first time. And so our text records Jacob's response to this call to return to his meeting place with God. In verse 2, in the beginning phrase of verse 3, he says to his household and all who are with him, put away the foreign gods from among you. Put away 
the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your garments. Then, then, Let's arise to the place of Bethel. Then let's go to the meeting place with God. Then let's go to the place where God can manifest himself to us. He gathers his family together, his life in ruins, his life in tatters, his faith messed up, and he says to the family, he says, we got to go meet with God. But first, we got to get rid of, of a few things. See, Jacob was a monotheist. He believed in one God, but he had picked up some idols along the way. Despite the fact that he knew that he was the son of Abraham and, a, uh, and of Isaac, that he was a descendant of the one true living God that had called his family out to have a great purpose and a great nation somewhere along the line mixed with his worship of the one true living God had come the worship of idols, false gods that infiltrated his life and his family. And before he made the journey back to Bethel, he already knew. If I'm going to meet with God, there's some things i got to get rid of. Moving to Bethel necessitated spiritual preparation beyond the level of an exercise in logistics. It was more than packing the camels and rolling up the tent. Possession of idolatrous symbols, which in Jacob's context as figurines and amulets and cultic charms and literal idols were no longer terrible, were no longer allowable. Meeting with God first meant getting rid of their idols. First John chapter 5, verse 21 says, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. John, he is preaching to the church, amening himself, saying, Little children, keep yourselves from... I cannot preach to somebody here tonight on the opening night of uprising that the call of people desiring to meet with God comes with the same set of prerequisites that it came with in Genesis 35. Like Jacob... If you're going to want to meet with God, we first got to get rid of our idols. If we want to have a visitation with the Lord, Jacob knew when I get to Bethel, the heavens are going to open and I'm going to see angels and I'm going to see the presence of God and God's going to speak to me. But before I can get to that place of revelation, there are some things I've got to get rid of first. Praise God. And in our context, for some of us here tonight, it may be actual idols. I live in a diverse community. And I know that Western secularism only impacts a small amount of people. Because for many, New Age practices, ancestor spirits, paganism fortune telling, astrology, witchcraft, superstitions, and good luck charms find their way into the lifestyle of many people who also claim to be followers of Jesus. And over the course of things that we have all gone through together, Canada and Australia, very similar pandemic experiences. I have found as a pastor that people that had left some ways of thinking and ways of living behind found themselves isolated and alone, picking up some old familiar practices they once laid at an altar. And I'm here to preach to you today that if you want to experience the greatness of God in your life, you got to get rid of the idols. I, we could talk about what an idol fundamentally is in just a moment, but for many people, perhaps maybe even some in this room, Idolatry for you is not a Western extrapolation, but it could be actual idols and superstitions that you have in your life. Old ways of thinking, old old practices that, that are connected to a lifestyle, that are connected maybe to an identity, maybe connected to your family, maybe connected to an old religion. And I'm here to preach to you today a very simple message. 
message that if you want to meet with God, you've got to get rid of some idols. There is no room for the worship of your ancestors and the worship of Jesus Christ to be in the same place. There is no room for you to put your faith in God for your future and at the same time consult the stars. If you want to be with God, you've got to get rid of your idols. You've got to get rid Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 19 through 20, what am I trying to say? Am I saying that food offered to idols has some significance or that idols are real gods? No. No. Not at all. Verse 20, not at all. I'm saying these sacrifices are offered to demons, not to God. And I don't want you to participate in demons. He says it's very specific. I don't have time to geek out and hear it all tonight. But he says the idols are nothing. It means idolon, phantom. I've got an episode on it for my podcast, Shameless Plug. You can, you can go listen to it. <laughs> but idolon, it means phantoms. When, when Paul said that the idols were nothing, it was, it was to insult. He was, it was a pejorative. It was, he was insulting. He was insulting these other idols. But he was saying, these, these things that you worship, they're nothing. They're actually, they are figments of your imagination. Paul says these idols are not real gods. But behind these practices are spirits uh, that are involved in this worship. And what you are involving yourself in is stuff that is actually dark and perhaps even demonic and I'm here to let you know again if you want to meet with God you've got to get rid of your idols let's talk about what an idol is for a moment let's extrapolate it perhaps idols are simply man-made things that you worship an idol is anything that replaces your worship in Jesus an idol is anything that you incorporate into your life that replaces your worship of Jesus. As I was thinking and through this text and as I was studying and prepping for this message, I thought, why? It seems so silly for someone to seek a man-made object for some sort of transcendent experience. What is tra- I know that's like a $5 word. What is transcendence? It's It's to be in the presence of greatness that is so vast, so large, so overwhelming that by being in its presence alone, your humanity is dwarfed by this experience of divine. And as a result, your worldview is changed. The way you look at yourself, the way that you look at the world, the way you look at other people, everything in your life that is touched by this presence is somehow changed and transformed and altered in some way. So how in the world can a human-made object offer a transcendent experience? How can something that a person makes with their own hands then turn around and dwarf that human person with its greatness? It cannot. It's, it's, It's illogical. It's inept. It's crazy. So why do we do it? Why do we practice idolatry both in the literal and in the figurative sense in our modern culture? Control. Idols can be controlled, manipulated, cajoled for a life of your own making. And from this fundamental and basic definition, idols do not just have to be things from pagan religions and old lifestyles. It can be your career. It can be money. Young people, it can be social media fame and social status. It can be possessions. It can be people and relationships. It can be experiences and entertainment. And yes, even family. All about control. Using things and using people so that you can manage and create a life that you want for yourself. All so that you can manipulate money and things and people and experiences around you so that you can build a life that you desire. You can get a life that you want. And Jacob said to his family, if we're going to meet with God, we got to dump the idols. If we're going to meet with God, we've got to get rid of the strange gods. 
He says, put away the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your garments. Coupled with this call to turn in their false gods, everybody also changed their clothes. That means they purified themselves from anything that may have touched the idol. It wasn't just the act of burying or getting rid of the false gods. Everything that had come in contact with these false gods had to be changed as well. Because consecrating themselves to God was an all-encompassing, nothing left experience. Nothing was left untouched in their surrender to God. Romans 12 verse 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Present your bodies a living sacrifice in the New Testament and when you surrender your life to Jesus nothing has changed in the pursuit of just like with Jacob so it must be with us the whole sum of who we everything in our life that has been touched by the idolatry of modern life must be surrendered to Jesus Christ so they changed they collect all their foreign gods. And verse 4 says, they gave Jacob, they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands and the earrings which were in their ears. And then it says, Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree which was by Shechem. They gathered everything up including everything that had been touched by the paganism that they had brought into their life. And it says, he hid them. He didn't say, hey, this is, this is, this is the storage cabinet. We're going to keep everything. Don't go look at it. He didn't say, hey, you want to know what, guys? This is what we're not, we're not going to do this anymore. And so, like, I want you to know I put all the bad stuff over here. No, he hid it and buried it. Under the terebinth tree. He buried it so that there would be no option for anyone to go back. What I am preaching about here tonight is a consecration that you bring to the Lord that is so all of life, so all encompassing that you burn every bridge in your life that could keep you from going back to Jesus. You burn every bridge in your life that could push you back into the world. Really bury your idols. This is the part of the message where we get all uncomfortable and we talk about our real lives. Here are some ways that you can bury your idols. Some people love to bring up the past. Yes, you've got a testimony. But I've also run into Christians that they don't just like to talk about the life of sin they came from so that they can testify of the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. But they remember the thrill of a life of sin. And so they talk about it under the guise of testimony. So that they can relive those moments that they walked away from. If you catch yourself trying to revel in the life that you walked away from, you got to bury the idols. You got to really bury the reminders so that there's no option for you to go back and that there is nothing left untouched from your consecration to Jesus Christ. For some of us young people, young adults, for some of us it may be going through our actual closet and saying, you want to know what? This is how I used to look when I was at the club. This is how I used to look when I was at a party. You want? I'm just going to get rid of these things. I'm going to get rid of these things that used to remind me of the person I used to be. Perhaps if you have been controlled by entertainment, it's not just enough for you to put a parental block. For some in this room, what you've got to do is you've got to get rid of the subscription service altogether. Maybe Netflix needs to be gone. 
somebody, your family for a season. Maybe Disney Plus needs to be gone. Maybe HBO Max needs to be gone out of your life for a season so that you can get, you used to watch garbage and you got to get rid of everything in your life that used to control you and chain you and keep you back. If you used to be ruled by pornography, you need to dumb Snapchat off your phone. If you used to be ruled by pornography, you need to put blocks on your internet so that you can bury the idols and get rid of everything. For some of us, maybe you, maybe there's adults and young adults in this room. Your idol was stuff and spending money. Maybe it's time you cut up the credit card for a little bit. You got numbers on your phone that need to be deleted. You need to stop texting those people you used to party with. You need to stop communicating those people that, with those people that you used to sin with. If there are people, if, is, this, or is this all right? I don't know what's coming. Maybe it's the jet lag. I don't know. But if there are people that you used to drink, you used to fornicate with, you do not need those numbers on your phone. You do not need those. Well, I want to bring them to God. You get yourself right, and then you pray for the Lord to open up a door of evangelism, but you do not leave an option for you to go back to people you used to lay around. You do not give yourself the option to go back to the club. You don't, you don't have the number in your phone, so it's not even a possibility that you can cross the bridge back into the idolatry that you've hid at an altar in your life. I know, I know this is strong today. I know I'm being a little confrontational here today. But if you've got people that you used to be friends with, that you used to sin with, you need to get rid of them on social media. Young people, if there are people at your school that you are trying to emulate, that you know do not follow Jesus. If there are influencers that are leading you away from a consecrated life of being a follower of Jesus. You know, unfollow for a bit. And maybe unfriend. Clean up your social media. Delete those old photos. Dump the wine down the sink that you've had hidden in a drawer. Stop parking your car. In front of the liquor store. I'm talking, I, I don't know what it's like with all of you, but I live, my church is in the downtown. We've got a crack house on one side, and we've got a house of bad reputation on the other. I am smack in the middle of the world, and I am smack in the middle of the filth that is in the world. And the people that come to our church, they're not good people that need a little bit of Jesus to improve their life. They are messed up, they are lost, they are broken, they are bound by addiction they're all caught up in occultic practices and they're addicted to drugs and here's one thing I have understood with every crack addict that has walked away and never picked up a needle again every heroin addict that's walked away and has never fallen back into addiction every porn addict that has walked away from that sin and never picked it back up again they had to bury some things in their life they had to get radical for a season they had to Consecrate their hearts to the Lord. Praise God. Bear the idols if your stuff is things. You start making changes. If your career and money has been an idol, and you start paying your tithes, and you start coming to church. If it's been your career that you have worshipped, then you need to make coming to the house of God a priority. Taking care of your family, gentlemen, is a noble venture. But the greatest way that you can care for your family is to lead them into the presence of God. And if you are here tonight and you have never been baptized in the wonderful name of Jesus, what ultimately needs to be buried in your life is not things but you. What ultimately needs to be buried in your life is not what you used to also drink, but it needs to be your own soul. Because Romans chapter 6 verse 4 says, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life.
You've got to bury the old you in the wonderful name of Jesus. Let's go back to Jacob for a moment. Genesis 35. It says in verse 9, Then God appeared to Jacob again. When he came from Padana Ram and blessed him, and God said to him, Your name, Jacob, your name is Jacob, your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. Also, God said, I am God Almighty. I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply a nation, and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, I give to you. And to your descendants after you I give this land. Then God went up with him in the place where he talked with him. After all the idols are buried. After a great consecration has been made. God meets with Jacob. And he does two things with Jacob. He reveals himself. And he affirms Jacob's identity and his purpose. What are the two greatest human needs that I have found in my short 37 years of life? The two greatest human needs that I have found no matter where I have preached or where I have traveled or where I have gone. The two greatest human needs are to know God and to know why you exist. There is a hunger within the human soul to be in the presence of God. There is, as it were, it's an old adage, but it is true. There is a God-shaped hole in the soul of every human being. We long for God. We long to be in the presence of God. We long to know God and be known by God. And on top of this, there is a hunger to know why God put you here. Does life have meaning? Do I have meaning? Does life have purpose or do I just surf about the globe until death comes? Is there a mission for my life? Is there a plan that comes from God for me? And it is after the experience at the terebinth tree that Jacob receives both. It is at the burial of his idols, after the burial of the pagan and false and foreign gods that he had incorporated into his heart, that Jacob gets revelation of who God is and who God wanted him to be. At Bethel, Jacob can say, I have seen God. God has visited me. And he told me he is the Almighty One. This was more than an intellectual affirmation of the omnipotence of God. It was a revelation of who God was in his life. And he could say, now that I have seen God, I'm changed. My whole identity is changed. This is who I'm supposed to be now. I'm not just here to raise these flocks of sheep. I'm not here to build a kingdom for myself. I am here because I am part of the family of Abraham and Isaac. I am here on this earth because God has called me. He can say I am part of a purpose that is going to transform the world. From my family will come a nation. And from that nation will come one from whom the whole world will be blessed. This is why I am here when you see Jesus for yourself, when you see him as the almighty God, when you get a revelation of who Jesus is, it changes everything in your life. You want hope? You need to get a revelation of the mighty God in Christ. You want peace? You need to see Jesus. You want to be assured of your salvation? You need to see Jesus because when you really see Jesus, Jesus and he really sees you and changes you. I'm not just here to build a half decent life. I'm not just here as a teenager or a young adult to get some good grades, get into a good school, own a few nice things, have a car and a house or a condo downtown and maybe travel a little bit just to surf and bump along life until death comes. No, I am here in this life and I am in the school I'm at. I have the 
friends I do because God has called me here. God's got a purpose for my life. I'm part of the church of the living God. I'm here to serve God's mission. My stuff isn't mine. My money isn't mine. My life isn't mine. The family I will have isn't mine. The children I will have are not mine. We are here for a purpose greater than ourselves. We're here to build the kingdom. That's why you're here, young people. You're not just at this church because this is where your mom and dad go. You're here because God's called you here. You don't just go to the school you go to because that happens to be of the neighborhood you're a part of. No! God's called you there. You're here to build the kingdom of God and change the lives of your friends. God may even call you into the ministry. God may even call you to be a preacher of the gospel or a missionary. How different would you live your life if you knew this weekend God was going to call you and then use you in a way that would change the world. Moms and dads that are in this room, I know this is a youth-focused weekend, but moms and dads and grandparents and grandmas and aunts and uncles, how different would you live your life if you know that God was going to use your kids to change the world. I'm here to preach to you today. God does want to use your kids to change the world. God does want to call you to be a missionary to your culture. How different would you treat your resources of your time and your energy if you knew that God gave them to you to build his kingdom? What idols of career and wealth would you bury If you knew that if I start paying my tithe, that God is going to take that and he is somehow going to use it to preach the gospel to people. There are people, there are two young adults that I know that are very close to me that are about to walk into an extremely dangerous part of the world and they are there because they go to a church that has given to them. People working class people single moms grandparents retirees on fixed income open up their wallets and they said the resource of my money is not just for me but it is to be invested in the kingdom of heaven and there are people that will be saved over the next several years because there are individuals that have buried some idols and have got a revelation that God wants to use my life For his kingdom. How different musicians if you could come. Would you view yourself. As you get on the bus. Go to work. Walk into the grocery store. If you knew that God. Has anointed you. To make a difference. I am here to preach to you. That Jacob was uniquely called. But you are also uniquely called as well. And then God has anointed you to make a difference. Two greatest needs. To know God. To find purpose. And Jacob found both. After he hid his idols under the terebinth tree. I know I've said a bunch of stuff and I've meddled a whole lot in your life. But if there's a big point to my message to launch this weekend together, it would be this. Consecration always precedes revelation. That if you want to see God, so da baye If you came here and you're like, God, I need you to touch me. God, I need you to speak to me. If you're a young person here and you said, God, I need to know what my purpose is. God, I want to know if you've got a point to life. God, I want to know if I matter. God, I want to know if there's more to this than just existing, getting a job and showing up to church a couple times a week. God, I want to know if I matter for something bigger than me. Yes, you do. But if you want a revelation, 
explanation of what that is. There is a tree that you got to visit first. God wants to impart gifts and callings. God wants to move for the next several services and work miracles and signs and wonders. He wants to walk all up into your soul and turn the lights on in your mind over who he is and who you're supposed to be that used to be in the dark and give you illumination of his purpose and his plan for his life. But it doesn't just happen because we want it to. God didn't visit Jacob at Shechem. It happened at Bethel. And before there ever could have been a Bethel, there had to be a terebinth tree. I'm here to preach to some people here tonight that are hungry for a move of God. That if you want revelation and you want purpose, you want hope and you want mission, you want signs and you want wonders, it's going to come when you bury your idols. Maybe you're like Jacob. This wasn't his first time to ever be at Bethel. He had been at that place a long, long time ago. Maybe you've heard a message like this come across this pulpit before. I'm friends with your pastors. I watch your online services. I know the calls that come across this pulpit and from this platform. But I'm here as another voice to be like to be like your pastors have been to you over the past several years that you've been coming to this church and simply say, Hey, God wants to meet with you again. God wants to reveal himself to you again. God wants to impart a fresh word to you. But if you're going to get there, you're going to bow your knee at an altar of consecration one more time. I'm reaching for people right now. You've been to youth conventions. You've been to youth services. You've been to events. And you've heard the call from the man of God to repent of your sins. You've heard the call from the preacher to give your heart to Jesus. I know, talking about social media, talking about entertainment, talking about money, talking about your friends. These are not revelations to you. You have heard them all before. And so I am here to say, yes, you've heard them before. But now it's time to bury them once and for all. Not because you're afraid of God. Not because God is angry with you. Not because he is over you with his hammer of judgment and wrath. Ready to pull the carpet out from under your feet. If you don't turn, no, God loves you. And God will continue to love you. And God will continue to... I'm reaching for people that know that there is more to life than what they're experiencing and what they're living in. And they want purpose. And they want power. And they want to see God in a real way. God's going to show up in a real way. But you got to bury some things first. So I'm looking for young people. I'm looking for middle-aged people. I'm looking for kids. I'm looking for married, singles, university students to retirees. That will over the next couple minutes make their way to this altar. And find a place of prayer. And just say, God, I have made my career into an idol. I have made the pursuit of good grades an idol in my life. Lord Jesus, I have skipped out on church. And I have skipped out on being with your people. So that I could be with friends that I know are going to lead me in a wrong direction. Because they, God, they gave something to me that I know can only come for your presence, but no more. God, I'm there as we can stand, if we can stand all over this room, God is reaching for people right now. He is looking for young people. He's looking for parents to come out of their seats and make their way to an altar and say, Lord Jesus, we have been consumed with entertainment, but not anymore. We know there's revelation. We know there's purpose. We know there's power. So God, I'm coming to this altar today because I know you want to give me more. I know you want to show me more. I know you want to open up the heavens and you want me to 
see you. So God, I am here on an altar again tonight. Saying, Jesus, I'm surrendered to you. I said all over this room, I want you to talk to God. I want you to talk to God. This worship team is going to sing. For the first few moments of this altar call, I want you to talk to God in whole and complete sentences. Don't just repeat the same words of worship over and over again to God. But I want you to talk to the Lord about where your time is, where your mind is, where your resources are being spent. And I want you to say, Lord Jesus, I'm burying them at an altar. That's it. If you've been watching stuff, you know you shouldn't be watching. If you've been involved with friends that you know you shouldn't be involved with, this is where you say their names and say, God, we can't be on with them anymore on Friday nights. This is where you call out the shows that you've been binge watching that you know are contrary to the life that God has for you. And you say, no more, God. I am canceling that subscription. This is where you say to God, God, Snapchat has been a problem. Lord Jesus, Instagram has been a problem. Problem. So God, I'm getting off my phone for a season. Because God, I want to see you. That's it. I want you to lift your voice as they begin to sing. I want you to lift your voice as they begin to sing. And I want you to start talking to God. I want you to pour out your worship to God. I want you to pour out your consecration to the Lord. I want you to say, Jesus, all of me belongs to you. All of me belongs to you. That's it, that's it, that's it. That's it, I know I've challenged you tonight. But it's because there's revelation on the other side of surrender. There is revelation on the other side of consecration. You've come into this room looking for miracles. You've come into this weekend looking for signs and wonders and the heavens to be open. God's saying it will happen when your heart is open. if we have any elders we have any ministers any saints that want to come and pray with these young people and say God help them to consecrate their lives to you fill the room
is moving. And we're going to worship in just a moment. And this may feel like a very strange thing to do. But I just feel led of the Holy Ghost to direct our prayer. As millennials and Gen Zers, our lives are driven by influence or culture. YouTube, Instagram. There are people that have just risen up and they tell us what to buy. They tell us what's cool what's in, what our priorities should be. And I have been doing this long enough to know that there are young people in a room that have given equal access to their soul to people that they don't know online as they do their pastors and their spiritual leaders. And again, I know this is a unique thing to do but I want us, they're going to sing again. I want us to pray about the voices that we let speak into our hearts that we view or that we follow online. I want us to pray specifically about the YouTubers that we subscribe to, the Instagrammers that we follow, and the voice that they have in our life. I had Twitter off my phone for two years because I found that it had gotten so toxic. This is just for me. I'm not saying it's for everybody. I got off of it for several years because I found that the toxic tone that was on there was impacting my spirit and it was impacting my faith. And I was getting angry at people I didn't even know because they were saying dumb stuff online. And God spoke to me and said, why are you giving that a platform in your spirit? So I got it off my phone. I'm not saying you got to get it off your phone. I'm saying I had to get it off mine. I had to hide social media icons from my home screen because I was spending too much time on it. So I want to say, I know, I know this. there's like zero hype to this altar call, and I hope that's okay, okay? But look, God wants you to do an assessment right now of the voices that you are speak, allowing to speak into your life that are shaping every decision from the things you watch to the possessions that you buy the clothes you put on your body the words that you let come out of your mouth to the values that you help determine what is a good and satisfying life I feel specifically that this is a word for a handful of young people. That God wants you to talk to Him right now about the voices on those two platforms that are speaking into your life. Not because He's angry with you, but because He's getting ready to reveal Himself to you. Not because He's mad at you, but because He's getting ready to impart His gifts into your spirit you got to visit a terebinth tree of surrender so that come on let's pray right now Jesus I come before you Lord about my own habits about my own life that's it I want you to talk to him right now you don't have to pray so loud that the next person hears you but if there's an influencer that has been shaping your life, I want you to go ahead and name them to God and say, God, I need you to help me hit the unsubscribe button. So you guys can go ahead and start singing. God, not because I'm afraid that I'm going to be lost. Because God, I know, Lord, that I am in you and I am secure. But Jesus, because I know that you've got a plan for my life. I know, Lord Jesus, because you've got anointing for me. I know, God, that tomorrow night, Lord Jesus, there is going to be God, you are going to impart anointing and calling into my spirit. Come on, that's it. 
But God, I got to consecrate my life to you first. Oh, I give it all. Oh, Jesus, I give it all. Thank the Lord for his word here tonight. Hallelujah, Jesus. I believe regardless of our age, that is a word that we can apply to our lives. Yes, this altar is full of young people, but that is a word that if we apply to our lives, would draw attention to parts of our life 
that's distancing ourselves from His presence. Would you receive that word here? We're going to pray right now. And as we pray, I wonder if you just lift your hands towards heaven. That as we leave this place, we would ponder on the word that has been ministered to us. There is a part of every person's life here that if we are honest with ourselves, we can look at that we might be closer to Him. So let us pray. Father, we are grateful for Your Word that's been delivered here tonight, Lord Jesus. Father, I pray that this Word would find good soil in our spirit, Lord Jesus, that as we leave this place, we would ponder on Your Word. Let Your Word purge us and search us, Lord Father. Let it find parts of our life, Lord God, that do not glorify You, Lord Jesus. And I pray that we would make decisions tonight, Lord Father to release certain things and to turn away from certain parts of our life that we would, Lord God, be ever closer to your presence, Lord Jesus. I pray that the words that have been spoken tonight, Lord God, would find good soil. They would not be heard and forgotten, but they would be applied to our life, that we would be changed in a way that glorifies your name, Lord Jesus. We rejoice for what you have done. We are thankful for those that have been filled with the Holy Ghost tonight, Lord God. We worship you for what you have done in this place here tonight, Lord God. And we leave this place hungry for what you will continue to do. We give you all the glory, all of the honour and all of the praise in Jesus' Name. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. Would you please thank Brother Shaw for that powerful word. Let's give Brother Shaw a hand as well. Powerful word of God. But let us leave this place and not forget the words that have been spoken. Amen. Well, praise God, everybody. Please be reminded that we have Rotti and Curry in the foyer. Also for the young people, we're at Punch Bowl Rashes tonight. But we're thankful that you've joined with us here tonight. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Turn your neighbour, say 10 a.m and 6.30 p.m. for service. God bless you. God be with you. Amen.